Did you know that demonic possession cases are increasing? It's not really surprising because we're currently dealing with a great deal of evil all around the world and the internet and social media just makes it much, much worse. Father Gabriel Amor, the former chief exorcist of Rome, said he's not afraid of the devil. The devil was afraid of him. He performed over 60,000 exorcisms and he placed some of the blame on paranormal shows and the rise of occult practices like Satanism, seances, black magic, tarot card reading, etc. Because those things can open a person up to malevolent spirits. He also believed that people like Hitler and Osama bin Laden were influenced by demonic spirits. There's a never-ending amount of information on the topics that I just mentioned, like Satanism, seances, etc. And that makes it easier for people to dabble with things that they don't really understand. But no one can pinpoint the main cause of the rise in demonic possession. In 1949, William Peter Blatty read an article about a young man that was under demonic possession. The title of the article was priest frees Mount Rainier boy reported held in devil's grip. He read the article in the Washington Post when he was a 20-year-old English literature major at Georgetown University. If it wasn't for him, we probably wouldn't even know about the exorcism of Roland Doe. Roland Doe and the name Robert Mannheim is how the young man was referred to in order to protect his anonymity. We found out his real name after he passed away in 2020. His real name was Ronald Hunkiller. The movie he inspired was unlike anything moviegoers had ever witnessed in 1973, and it's often referred to as one of the scariest movies ever made. Lines to see the movie were so long that some theaters even provided coffee, and when audiences became sick to their stomachs while they were watching the movie, they also handed out barf bags. The movie caused some people to faint, especially during the very realistic cerebral angiography scene. It also brought about an increase in claims of demonic possession. Heart attacks and a miscarriage were also reported. And the movie triggered a phenomenon called cinematic neurosis. And cinematic neurosis is a form of psychological crisis that's shaped by exposure to a film that is emotionally and culturally significant to the individual. And Jaws is another movie that triggered cinematic neurosis. The Exorcist was the first horror film ever nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture, and it's the fifth highest grossing horror movie of all time. It helped to jumpstart the possession side of horror, and even after 49 years, horror fans are still fascinated with movies about demons and demonic possession. Ronald did experience the scratches, the screaming, the spitting, and the cursing, but his head doesn't spin all the way around, and Captain Howdy and the version of the demon Pazuzu that was unearthed in Iraq were completely fictional. He also never used a bloody crucifix or did he spider walk, but he did speak of and act out sexual acts in a disrespectful manner. Ronald Edwin Hunkler was born on June 1st, 1939 to an ordinary middle-class tight-knit German-American family in suburban Washington, D.C. It was claimed, and it still currently is sometimes, that the family lived in Mount Rainier, Maryland, but an investigative journalist confirmed that the family had lived in Cottage City, Maryland at one point when he spoke with multiple Mount Rainier residents. The family later moved to St. Louis and it's where the actual exorcisms took place. A great deal of this information is from the diary of Father William Powder. In 1948, Roland's aunt Tilly, who was a spiritualist and had taught him how to use a Ouija board, she died and he became so distraught that he attempted to contact her through the board. Now this was obviously a terrible mistake because soon after, the paranormal activity began. On January the 15th of 1948, the activity started with scratching sounds coming from underneath the floor in Ronald's grandmother's bedroom, which was above his. The family was experiencing what Father Amort called the infestation phase.
In addition to the scratching sounds that came from the basement, the family also experienced water dripping from pipes and walls and a smell of excrement was everywhere and objects were suspended in the air. On a different day, Ronald told his parents that he saw an image of Jesus in his grandmother's room and that it moved as if someone was hitting the wall behind it. At first, the family thought it was mice and they called in pest control, but it clearly wasn't a rodent. Ronald's mother said she heard something scratching his mattress and then it fell on the floor. His mattress would also move violently at night, just like Reagan's did in the movie. The scratching lasted for about 10 days and then it just stopped. One night, Ronald, his mother, and his grandmother were all lying on his bed when they heard something coming toward them that sounded like marching feet and the beat of drums. The sound would travel the length of the mattress and then repeat. The mother asked whatever was doing it a question. She said, is this you, Aunt Tilly? She continued asking questions, but she didn't receive a reply. She then asked, if you are Tilly, knock four times. She received a reply because waves of air hit them and four distinct knocks were heard on the floor and claw marks were now seen on the mattress. On one occasion, the coverlet was pulled out from under the mattress and the edges stood up above the surface of the bed in a curled form as though they were held up with starch. When they touched the bedspread, the sides fell back into normal position, and the scratching on the mattress was continuous since the first night it was heard. A friend that was visiting the family experienced the phenomena firsthand. He watched as Ronald was thrown from a chair and landed several feet away. It was the first time that someone outside the family had witnessed the horror Ronald and his family were going through. At school, a classmate witnessed Ronald's desk move in a way that mimicked the plate on a Ouija board. His teacher yelled for him to stop, but he told her he wasn't doing it. And he was so embarrassed that he stopped going to school for a while. In the kitchen, the breadboard was thrown onto the floor. Outside the kitchen, a coat on its hanger flew across the room. A comb flew violently through the air and extinguished blessed candles and a Bible was thrown directly at Ronald's feet. On February the 26th, a little over a month after his aunt died, scratches appeared on his body each night for four straight nights. After the fourth night, actual words were scratched on his body with what looked like claws. One evening, the word Louis, L-O-U-I-S, was written on Ronald's ribs in deep red. Next, when someone asked when they should leave for St. Louis, the word Saturday was written plainly on his hip. The words always appeared without any help from Ron, and his mother was keeping him under close supervision. These marks caused him a lot of pain, and it caused him to double up and make a terrifying sound. The markings could not have been done by him because on one occasion, the writing appeared on his back. They were now in the oppression phase. Long welts began to appear on his body, and by this point, the family was so afraid and frustrated that they took him to see a medical doctor, a psychologist, a spiritualist, and a psychiatrist. Even Duke University's parapsychology lab was involved. The doctors were of no help. They just believed Ronald was just a high-strung teenager. The family also sought help from their Lutheran minister, who agreed to observe Ronald. He even stayed at the reference home overnight, but the paranormal phenomena continued and it actually escalated. Because he was now able to witness how bad things were, he recommended the family contact a Catholic priest, so Ronald was taken to Georgetown University Hospital. All medical means of treatment had to be exhausted before the exorcism could be approved, and Ronald's test results failed to find anything abnormal that might explain the alleged paranormal phenomena. Ronald's exorcism was considered a major exorcism. A cousin of the family was attending St. Louis University and she told Father Raymond Bishop what her cousin was experiencing. They were also put in touch with Father Walter Holleran and Reverend William Bowden. 
When Ronald and his mother arrived in St. Louis, Father Bishop visited the family and he blessed the home. During the visit, long scratches in the shape of a cross also appeared on Ronald's body and objects, including holy water that flew across the room. While staying with relatives in St. Louis, he felt a sharp pain on his stomach when the mother pulled back the covers and lifted his pajama top. She saw zigzag scratches and bold red lines on his abdomen, and this was witnessed by six people. Another time, a cross mark was scratched onto his left outer forearm. Fathers Bowden and Bishop sought permission from St. Louis Archbishop Joseph Ritter to perform the formal rite of exorcism, and Ritter agreed. Bowden asked Holleran to drive him to dinner at a home in a St. Louis suburb. Holleran had no idea what he was getting into. He was 27 and was a young priest at the time. He thought he would just be waiting outside, but when they pulled up to the house, Bowden turned to him and said, I'll be doing an exorcism and I want you to hold the boy down in case it's needed. As the priest prayed, Ronald's reactions became extreme. And this is what Father Bishop wrote in his diary on March 18th, 1949. The prayers of the exorcism were continued and R was seized violently. So he began to struggle with his pillow and the bed clothing. The arms, legs, and head of R had to be held by three men. The contortions revealed physical strength beyond natural power. R spit at the faces of those who held him and at those who prayed over him. He spit at the relics and at the priest's hands. He writhed under the sprinkling of holy water. The exorcism rite was eventually moved from the Bell Moore House to other locations in St. Louis, including the rectory of College Church, Alexian Brothers Hospital, and Jesuits White House Retreat Center on March the 21st. While making the Stations of the Cross outdoors, Ronald attempted to jump off a high bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. Holleran managed to tackle him before he could jump off the cliff. As the exorcism rites were being performed, Ronald would sometimes have seizures. He would vomit, urinate, spit, and speak in Latin even though he didn't know the language. He was now in the possession phase. St. Louis University while staying in a residence for Jesuits, a priest heard who laughed that he said froze his blood. The violent reactions always came after the prayers of the exorcism. There hadn't been any violence from Ronald before the exorcism started. The most distinct markings on Ronald's body were the picture of the devil on his right leg and the word hell on his chest. The imprint of the devil in red and the word hell appeared during the rites of liberation, and that's when the priest demands the evil spirit identifies itself. The word was written so plainly that Ronald could look down at his chest and easily read it. The arms on the devil were above his head and seemed to be webbed, making it look like a bat. When asked how many demons were inside him, one line was scratched on Roland's right leg. In all, he was branded 30 times all over his body throughout the course of the exorcisms. He was also having nightmares where he saw himself fighting a huge red demon who felt slimy and was very powerful. And he said it was trying to prevent him from getting through the iron gates at the top of a pit that was about 200 feet deep and was very hot. At this point, Ronald had to be held by two of the priests because he was fighting with the evil spirit. And because this went on for hours, with breaks in between, Ronald was so exhausted that he couldn't even sit up or even hold his eyes open. On March the 17th, his family flew in from Maryland after hearing about that particular night. When his parents arrived, he spat in the face of his mother, his father, and his uncle with his eyes closed, yet he had perfect aim. And he went to sleep about 1.30 that night, and 12 hours later, he had another spell and had to be held down by three men again. He squirmed when he was sprinkled with the holy water, and again he screamed in a diabolical, high-pitched voice. And he was moving his feet in a rhythmical fashion, and Father Bowden held the Blessed Sacrament three or four inches from the sole of Ronald's feet 
and the movement stopped. This manifestation of the power of the Blessed Sacrament showed up time after time without fail. When the exorcism started back up again, he went back into his tantrum even when he was trying to repeat some short prayers with Father Bowden. He suddenly stood up in bed and he fought everyone around him. His face was devilish. He also snapped at the priest's hand during the blessing and he bit whoever was holding him at the time. His gyrations were in all directions. He pulled off the upper part of his underwear and he held his arms high above himself in supplication. Then he made as though he was trying to vomit from his stomach. His gestures moved upwards close to his body. He seemed to try to lift the devil from his stomach to his throat and he asked that the window be opened and then in a happy victorious mood he said he's going he's going and finally there he goes. Ronald got out of bed put on his bathrobe and saw the fathers off and he was very happy. About 2 p.m. or a little later he felt strange sensations in his stomach and in a few moments he began to call out he's coming back he's coming back. Because of his outbursts, he was moved to a room away from the regular patients in the Alexian Brothers Hospital where he could scream without bothering the rest of the hospital. Plus, they had the equipment that was needed to hold down patients in bed when they became violent. The following morning, Ronald went back to his aunt and uncle's home for the day. Father Bowden got him a room at the college church rectory with two beds so Roland's father could stay with them. But things soon reached a fever pitch when he punched Father Holleran in the face, breaking his nose. On April 1st, Ronald and his father decided he should be baptized as a Catholic. All hell broke loose because in the car on the way to the church, he grabbed the steering wheel and he put up a serious fight. While Ronald was suffering through the spell, the radio stopped working. Once he came out of it, the radio worked fine again. It took three men to carry him into the church and he had to be taken to the college church rectory and placed on the bed where he went in and out of seizures. He was eventually able to complete the exorcism, but his first Holy Communion was under extraordinary opposition. On Easter Monday, April the 18th, Ronald woke up in a fit. At 1045, Ronald was having a seizure, but he was calm. And in a clear, commanding tone, a voice broke into the prayer. It said, Satan, Satan, I am Saint Michael and I command you, Satan, and the other evil spirits to leave the body in the name of Dominus immediately. Now, now, now. His body went into the most violent spasm he'd gone through throughout the whole rite. And then he said, he's gone. And he spoke about what he saw. It was all over. More than 20 exorcisms were performed on Ronald over a period of two months. The Archdiocese of St. Louis received a formal report on the exorcism, closing the matter formally. Ronald wrote to Father Bowden thanking him, mentioning his new dog and his normal life. It was as if nothing had happened. He went on to attend a Catholic school and became a devout Catholic. He got married, had three children, and he even named his first child Michael for the Archangel. He also had a successful career at NASA for over 40 years. A friend said that he was always on edge about his colleagues finding out that he was the inspiration for the exorcist. And on Halloween, he always left the house because he was worried that someone would come to his home. He died in May of 2020 after suffering a stroke, never having spoken publicly about the events of 1949. And following the exorcism in the Alexian Brothers Hospital, the room where Ronald stayed, it was boarded up and sealed, and the entire facility was torn down in 1978. To psychiatrists, Ronald suffered from a mental illness. To some priests, he was demonically possessed. To writers and movie producers, his story was there to be exploited for profit. Everyone involved saw what they were trained to see. So who or what do you believe?